trust you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, we're going to get going with our uh, next round of presentations. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, my name is Anna Warwick Sears. I'm the Executive Director of the Okanagan Basin Water Board. And together with the BC Water and Waste Association, we're co-hosting co this uh, conference. So welcome. I uh, have a great pleasure today to uh, introduce Brock Dolman. Uh, we invited him here uh, as a speaker he, from Northern California. Now, I used to work down in the same watershed as Brock, and I knew him as a, a local guy, fisheries expert, really knowledgeable. He would um, he acted he was a reviewer on a watershed plan that I was working at. We sat on the same committees, and and it, you know we had a, a good collegial relationship. And then one time we were having one of these little uh, what's happening in the watershed workshops. And uh, this was about six years ago. And I gave my little talk on weed management. And then Brock came on. And his talk, and I think it was on salmon, just knocked my socks off. I was like, here is this jewel in our midst of a speaker. And uh, I was totally impressed with it. And then uh, I think it was last year, I had gone back down to California to attend a conference. and um, It was a, a quite a large conference, the Bioneers. And it, there was about, I don't know, 800 people there, and they were streaming it live internationally. And there was Brock as like a plenary speaker, and, and I was like, wow, he's gone big time. <laughs> and it turned out that um, the topic that he talked on last year was a topic that related directly uh, to a lot of the issues that we're experiencing here in British Columbia. And this is kind of joining together these ideas about watershed management, stormwater, going from personal responsibility up to this bigger picture perspective about why we're all doing this and uh, linking it to climate change. And I thought, this is a terrific presentation and I would love to see Brock come and uh, do this in the Okanagan. So as um, we had been talking about doing this kind of rain to resource conference for quite a while and, and so I kept that kind of simmering in the back of my mind and then when the, we received the funding from NRCAN and all this started coming together we were talking about keynote speakers and I immediately thought of Brock and I was delighted that he was able to come and I'm delighted that he can uh, share with you his, his insight on, uh, on water management. So thank you, Brock. Can you all hear me if I stand back? Just pick it up. Okay. Can you get mic there? A little bit, yeah? Well, all right. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Everybody's got a big belly full of food. This is one of the speaker's nightmare moments, right? You're going to get blood <laughs> down there. And, but um, uh, thanks for having me, and, and thanks, Anna, for inviting me up. And, uh, we certainly miss Anna's uh, prowess down there, and you all are lucky to have her. And I, I gather from the folks I've talked to, you guys recognize that. So um, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm uh, the gal, I think her name was Jody. Jody, remember that? Mentioned yesterday that you're a biologist, and you're like, well, what was I doing in this building thing? And I'm, I'm in the same boat. I'm, I, I was a kid, came out the womb kicking and screaming, chasing creepy, crawly, slimy, venomous thorny, muddy-looking creatures and such, and ultimately they increasingly became more and more rare and rare and hard to find, and I went to college and became a wildlife biologist with a specialization in endangered species vertebrates. And it became pretty clear to me that human land use in its multivariate forms is the driver behind these processes pushing these species to rarity or extinction. And that really led me to wondering, well, What's up with human land use? And so I come to this work not as a civil engineer, I'm not a hydrologist. I'm just a biologist trying to figure out how to work with you bipedal sacks of saline solution here <laughs> and get you onto a path that's good for critters or better for critters, us included as critters. We are animals as far as I remember. Um, I, I live and work in a place in western Sonoma County, which is about an hour and a half north of San Francisco. It's a coastal county, Redwoods, Beach, wine country. Um, we're better than Napa, right? I don't know about Okanagan yet. I, I look forward to keep sampling your wines up here. 
And, and I live on this 80 acre parcel and there's 11 of us who co-own this piece of ground together. It's an intentional community. And we've got a bunch of houses. If anyone knows of the Farallons Institute, if you've got an appropriate technology history background, this is the rural center for the Farallons Institute. And there's kids and families and folks. It's a residential community. There's about 25 that live there. Then we've got programs and workshops. And I call it an intentional community because I'm, as a biologist, I'm interested in living intentionally with both the human side of things, but ultimately with all life forms. How do we have intentional community with all life? And those are just critters we live with. And we're a, a educational demonstration organic farm. We're the sixth oldest certified organic farm in the state of California. And we produce all kinds of food. And it's lovely, yummy food. We have a seed saving collection. We have about 3,000 varieties of open pollinated heirloom vegetables, seeds, medicinal plants, that kind of stuff, and fruit. And that's part of our work. And ultimately, <clears throat> getting to water, the clarity for us is no water, no food. And a lot of folks talk about food security, but water security is on an order of magnitude more important, I think. And this is our pond. It's just a rain catchment pond. It fills up when it rains, tops off, and then we use it as a big water tank. It's a, about a two million gallon uh, water hole there. It's a great place to go in the, uh, obviously swimming in the summer. As of four days ago, I wasn't there, but I heard we just got nine and a half inches of rain in 24 hours. We got 13 and a half inches of rain in basically a day and a half in October. Like we never get that kind of rain and if we're gonna get it, it would be December or January. So um, leading into this realm of trying to, what I call basins of relations and how do you think like a watershed, in this case, the Okanagan watershed um, and the linkage to climate change. Uh, this, what I like to call, there's climate change, global warming, but I think the, the proper phrase we should really think about it is, is really uh, global weirding. Right, because that tail of the snake is just going to get more erratic and more intense and we've heard a lot of, of really good information this weekend. And, and so I, I, was, I had a presentation before and then after yesterday and, and today I, I adjusted a whole bunch of this to be honest with you because I want to give props to everybody I heard, all the speakers I heard, uh, as far as the, the engineering, the technical know-how, the implementation, the policy stuff, the thinking it through, your water balance. Uh, understanding, you guys are, I, I, I just give you props here, as, as far on the cutting edge of this work as any, anybody I know down in the states. And, um, and I think that you're, you're um, I'm just really impressed by the work you're doing, so I want to give you all some props here in reverse. Um, so how is it that a biologist ends up running a nonprofit that I call the Water Institute, where I'm really looking at watershed and how do we do advocacy, training, education, research, and restoration on behalf of water? And, and somebody said earlier this morning, I forget his name, one of the, the mayors that talked about in climate change where the mitigation side is really a, a CO2 question, the carbon dioxide question, but the adaptation side is really a water-sided issue. And that's, I want, I want to weave that story through because I am very much in line with that notion. First of all, I need to disavow you of something that if you believe this entity here, is called planet Earth, you've been misled. It's really planet water. If you think about it, as you look, at, and we're looking around the planets and such that we know, this is the water planet. 70% of the surface of this planet is water. If you take the volume of water, it's 97% is in the oceans, 2% the poles and glaciers, deep groundwater. And then we got 1% of fresh water. And I'll get more into that relationship of those three phase states. So I think that becomes really critical to this discussion. I know there's a lot of excitement that we get to colonize the moon because we found some solid water on the dark side there. As far as I can tell, we can't even manage water budgets on planet water. It's not clear to me we're going to do very well on the moon. I'm happy to pay for people's tickets who want to go up to the moon and get them off of here so we can get back to living on the beautiful planet. Um, scientifically, we know this is a molecule, right, H2O. And I think generally it's understood that's the magic Mickey Mouse molecule. It's got those two hydrogen ears, that big oxygen face, got the plus charges on the hydrogen, that negative charge. It's a, a polar molecule, a bipolar molecule. I always thought bipolar was a real estate opportunity in the Arctic, but, or something you need to take a pharmaceutical for. Um, but the, it's really cool that this has this molecule has this charge. It does amazing things. I mean, imagine this substance and, and right, that as a solid, it floats on its liquid self and you could hit a solid with sunlight and just go into a gas without even becoming a liquid? Like my task as I reoriented my slides was to feel like you guys are drilled down, you got the technology 
really well, the techniques, the implementation stuff. And so I'm feeling like I just want to bring you back here at the end with the bases loaded. I know the Giants are winning. Um, bad metaphor here, but go San Francisco. Um, <laughs> to be clear about it, this is about California and Texas, in my mind. And left and right and red and blue, and there's a lot riding on this game down in the middle. Um, so go Giants. Um, that, uh, just to get back a little bit and just trip out on the wonder of this amazing, amazing molecule, this thing called water. And, and if, if ice sank, wow. All bets would be off, right? And this whole thing of the, the water cycle, there was a poll out a couple years ago in America where they asked people to name one part of the water cycle and 50% of the people polled were basically silent. They couldn't say lake, rain, toilet, bottle, water, they, they were silent. So the level of hydrological illiteracy is, is of epidemic proportion, I would argue, down where I come from. I mean, it's job security for those of us who make a living trying to educate folks in this realm. Um, Water's a noun, it's a thing, you can ski on it and throw a snowball and drink it and swim on it, but it's kind of a verb if you think, and that's the interesting thing about water, is the total water on the planet is absolutely finite. The volume of that water, what phase stated in is what changes, where it's apportioned, but the volume is finite. But because it's based on an annual solar driven cycle, its renewal into your watershed annually is infinite, or at least we hope so. So it's really different than certain resources that are truly finite, like fossil fuels. Like there were, the planet only put so much carbon away a while ago, and, and, and we're not making any more of that at any rate that's useful. But water's a really, it's infinitely finite if you get the, the dance with the noun verb game I'm playing with here. And what we ultimately realize, I think, is that the water cycle and the life cycle are the same dang cycle. There's no separation in that cycle. And sustainability, I would argue, is about your ability to sustain the cycles of life. And this, we can talk about earth and air and fire and water, those elemental forces that create conditions conducive for life. But at some level, uh, if we don't have the ability through our settlement patterns to sustain uh, processes that honor the cycles of life and you, you compromise those cycles, your carrying capacity in that place will be compromised. That would be my argument on this one. Every living organism on the planet, when it's actively alive and well, is by volume mostly water, right? And that's hopefully the case in this room. We should propose a toast. <laughs> Coca-Cola is mostly water, but you guys should stay hydrated. Being hydrated is the most important thing you can do. Right? Um, if it's it's hard to fathom, but as a baby, as a baby, a human baby, they're pushing eighty percent plus water when they're born, and the older you get, the less by water you are volumetrically, and death is a function of dehydration for hominids and watersheds, and so this cyc <clears throat> cycling of water becomes really critical, and it leads some to a reverential relationship with rehydration, if you will. Uh, this is I did a trip to eastern Tibet, southwestern China this last year with a film crew, a Tibetan film crew, seeking out sacred headwater Buddhist shrines and temples up in the Himalaya and looking at, at climate change and glacial recession. And these folks, uh, their, their expression on, of water is bordering on reverential flotsam. I mean, you've never seen so many prayer flags. And they have these amazing little, every little creek in the watersheds as you're driving around have these little water-powered prayer wheels. Right? So there's a little bit of water here and it's turning a little paddle wheel that's turning these these prayer wheels and it, they're just putting out prayers to the watershed and I was pretty impressed by just the dedication of that culture I'm not that accustomed to it I mean in America we we deeply revere water right we honor it you know. <laughs> as they say I guess if the solution of pollution is dilution then having some pure water nearby can help get that donut down your gullet there is a good business model it's a stack function <laughs> game there if you perceive, if you're banking on the fallacious filtration fetish that a corporation is going to be providing you with the substance that you need to survive via a plastic bottle, I would argue that you may be a tad bit. <laughs> I didn't name that corporation, the French did. And they're super clear that if you're willing to pay them 3,000% for bottled water that's unregulated, when coming out of your tap with better regulation, at least where I come from, the, the percentage on that is so much less, then they're happy to take your money, for sure. 
the water supply system that you're looking for is called a watershed. And it's from, it's from the headwaters and the middle reach down to the mouth and wherever it discharges. And it's that cycle there, that's the, that's the water machine we're looking for. That's the, the deal and how, how we interface with that so that if you believe in a bottle, then you'll allow this to get trashed. If you say, oh, we can just filter it and it's fine, then you'll let the headwaters get trashed. If you don't, then you think like a watershed, you'll, you'll really begin to see that if you want to save the river, you start at the ridge line. If you want to save the sea, you start at the summit. And we're really looking at this integrated, connected whole. And I'm always interested in, in, in marketing and the mnemonics, the memes, they call them these days. The meme, like how do we infect each other with the sense of connectivity, and mostly it's for selling things. And have people seen this, this campaign's been pretty uh, effective on the folks in Lake Tahoe, bumper stickers are everywhere, keep Tahoe blue. And I think it's been really effective and I'm trying to figure out for you all, like, you know, what does keep Okanagan blue look like? And thankfully though, I was happy to see that the folks at the water board there have your one valley, one water concept. And that, that resonates with me and I'm, I'm glad, you, you know, that there's a sense of the connectivity that what unifies your collective community, this is where I get back to basins of relations, is the relationship that's shared within your system is basically a water defined. It's a topography, geology, hydrologically defined community boundary. I know you've got little cities in between, but at some point the water becomes the lubricant within the connective tissue of, of, your, of your community. And I don't know if folks know Luna Leopold. He was the son of Aldo Leopold, who was a very famous conservationist in America, he wrote a book called Sand County Almanac. And this idea that the health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. And so finding something like water, both quantity and quality, back to the two Q's, for sure. You gotta, if you're watching your P's and Q's, you better watch your Q and Q. Uh, that water in its health, that's your principal measure. Water won't lie to you. It's crazy honest in that regard. And so if we go back to the big level, back up to planet water for a second, then the health of the water on the planet is a principal measure of how we've been living on the land and the relationship of how it's performing, how it's behaving, becomes of paramount interest, which is why I'm back to supporting that notion that in the adaptation side of climate change, using the water cycle as the driver for design has the best opportunity to get us to all of the other land uses that we're worried about. And there's been a bunch of data on, on climate change, and I don't think you need to listen to all the scientists to tell you climate change is happening. It's pretty clear it's happening, right? <laughs> I was in Brazil in 2008, and I can tell you that that's a big bathing suit on Ipanema Beach. <laughs> and in 2010, the naked truth of the matter is, as far as I can tell, is the game on. Right? And it's not when climate change happens. Some of the stuff we saw in the, and from Prince George in the other panel earlier, they've got data for 50 years showing that these curves are already being impacted. So we're, we're already deep in the midst of climate change. It's not a, this is not a future science fiction story. And some of this uh, kind of information from the IPCC here, even though this is 07, what it missed, what's not on here is, is ocean acidification. But everything else, the average air and ocean temperatures, this widespread melting of snow and ice, and this global mean sea level. Here's the deal. Every foundational expression of global weirding on planet water is a water-based indicator. It's got to be. The, the thermodynamics of this planet trying to adapt to an increase in heat via the thickening of the blanket, this greenhouse effect, which is super cool, but you're in bed and I'm going to put a blankie on. And then I'm going to put another blanket on. And I'm going to keep layering blankets on the bed and you don't get to kick a leg out. How are you going to respond? Your, your water body, you. You're going to have to sweat and you're going to darn well try to change the phase state from a liquid to a gas. Because that's a cooling reaction. It's just the straight chemistry of it, right? Well, the planet's got one trick up its sleeve better. It's just going to flat out melt every scrap of solid it can find. And we know this from what's happening in the, in the, up in the poles and and up on the ice caps and in the Arctic and even in Greenland, like this ice cube is in the drink already. When, when the Arctic, that floating ice melts, change in elevation of sea levels may in fact, right, ice because it's got air in it in certain ways has 
you don't necessarily get a total rise in, in elevation, but that ice cube sitting up there or the stuff that's on your mountains or on the glaciers in the Tibetan plateau, what they call the third pole, there's the North Pole, South Pole, and then the Himalayas called the Third Pole. The recession of those glaciers, that water isn't in, in, the, in the drink as of yet, in the glass, in the ocean, right? And I'm really interested in this change in, and both of the, the few talks I heard about climate change and the predictions had a lot to do with what I saw for you all, which resonates with what we're, our models are telling us for California, which is basically, precipitation will either remain similar or even go up for the most part on average, but what's gonna change is what phase state you're getting it in. And generally we're looking at more liquid and less solid, which relates to increased runoff in the winter, increased flows and flooding to that extent, and less <coughs> solid water stored high up in a system to leak out late in the season and keep those reservoirs or groundwater recharged. So we're gonna get a faster movement of the cycle of the fresh water cycle going back to the ocean faster and faster. In my state, 80% of California is dependent on Sierra snowpack. And the predictions down there are basically that at 7,500 years out, we very likely will have many winters with very little, less than 10% snowpack in those mountains out there. So it's a big deal. And remember the slide that said global mean sea level? It didn't say global nice sea level rise. It said, it'll be nice when the sea level comes up because it's all changing. That 97% ocean, 2% solid, 1% fresh. The loser in the game is the 2% solid and the winner is the ocean for the warming trend. I'm not, I'm not gonna get into rapid onset cooling and how quickly the glacier's coming back to the Okanagan, but we'll leave that for a little ways out. But here, if anyone's been to the Bay Area, San Francisco is on this peninsula, Marin County, I live up here in Sonoma, and the blue, dark blue is the current shoreline, and the light blue is an estimate of a one meter sea level rise. So Sacramento in the Central Valley through our delta, right, that's predicted to be basically inland sea with a one meter sea level rise. We're up eight inches by record under the Golden Gate in the past 100 years already, and our governor, Schwarzenegger, his blue ribbon delta panel, their conservative estimate is, is that this prediction looks to be fairly solid out at a 75 year horizon. So I'm of the, I've, my wife calls me a preparanoid, but I'm, I'm of the mind that planning is best done in advance. <laughs> and so give me the data, just give us the data and then we'll wrangle with the adaptation to the implication of the data but as far as I can tell, we're going to have a lot more affordable housing where I come from, right? That's housing you have to afford through the water to get to, that's affordable? No. Right? It makes some critters wonder what's up with the hominids here. They're, it'll be safe to cross the lily pad at some point with our western pond turtle. I got the turtle peak over here, I got a problem. So hopefully you have a sinking feeling at this moment. You're like, oh, dude, you're bumming me out. Um, <laughs> The folks who survived this big sinking change in paradigm here, call it your titanic change, are the ones that get themselves in a lifeboat. And I would argue the lifeboat you're looking for is called a watershed. It's from stem to stern, around the rim, the basics of the three-dimensionality as a topophiliac. The three-dimensionality, if you were to cup your hands and see the rim of your fingers and the creeklets and the, the main stem of the river between your palms and it empties at the delta of your wrists, that living lifeboat is what you all got going on. And in this case, for this talk, it's the Okanagan lifeboat. And you all know your geography way better than I do in your places and such, but from the top end to the bottom, and then you're worried about, okay, these folks, well, whose water are they using and who has the right rights to it? And water quantity's coming off and quality's going and where are the fish moving? Are the adults getting through and are the babies getting out? And where's that phosphorus coming that, that Stu talked about? And, I think when you start thinking like a watershed, you realize you all are, those of you who live in this lifeboat together, share this common relationship. You may have your parochial city-based rivalries, but at some point when the, the you know, stuff hits the, <clears throat> the fan there, banding together lifeboat by lifeboat, watershed by watershed to retrofit and, and rework or uh, with new construction, land use practices that improve resiliency and performance in water quantity and quality and soil retention and in carbon sequestration and biodiversity and in, in your built infrastructure. Your lifeboat's either gonna float better than those that didn't or not. 
And I'm interested in supporting all the lifeboats and getting their act together, i.e. watersheds. So it's not a NIMBY syndrome. But, and, and obviously your all's lifeboat here is, is sort of a little small one on the big, right? So you gotta figure out how to get the whole Columbia Basin ocean liner to sort itself out. But, but it is worth fractaling up to a scale that you feel like you've got some relationship to. And so the Okanagan has merit in just thinking about it, although it's not disconnected by any stretch, right? And the fun part is, is everybody basically lives in a watershed on the planet, and so we have the opportunity to do this kind of work at a global level that has universality, but drill it down to a local level that, that's custom to place. So there's a scale linking uh, potential here. And for me, again, if, if water's the principal measure of how we live on the land, then these organisms like totem salmon, these Chinook in this case from the Eel River down in, in Humboldt County, are kind of the charismatic canaries in the coal mine. And are they doing well or not is, is an interesting indicator, a benchmark for your human settlement. Fascinatingly enough, a fish like that, say a 50 pounder King Chinook, started out as a little egg in the gravel and a little baby and then headed out and spent three years plus out in the ocean, got super fat, swims all the way back up, assuming it can get back up dams and barriers and all that kind of stuff, spawns and then dies, right? And in that death is what? Oh, it's the nitrogen and phosphorus, potassium and calcium. Studies down in Oregon looking at the needles in a Douglas fir tree and at Nadromus, salmon bearing watersheds. 60% of the nitrogen in the needle is of marine origin isotopically. They're looking at grizzly bear bones up in the, I wonder if I can go back to this guy. My family cabin is, is up here off the Henry's Fork of the Snake River in Idaho, and we used to be able to get fish all the way to there, and they took a grizzly bear that had been shot in 1872 when Yellowstone was made a park, and the museum folks, they went in and sampled the calcium from that bone some years ago. 50% of the calcium in that grizzly bear bone was of marine origin isotopically that far away from the coast, and grizz didn't make the trip. So the importance of these fish, besides the fact that they taste good and they probably pair well with an Okanagan Pinot Noir, <laughs> is, um, is that these critters, and for you all, from my understanding here, you're basically your sockeye kokanee, interesting conundrum. We have steelhead and rainbow trout, same kind of thing, right? They're steelhead if they're anadromous and they're rainbows if they stay, and your kokanees if they stay, and they're sockeyes. And, and apparently you had an amazing sockeye run. From what I've been being told, you just had an incredible, the, the capacity of the planet to surprise the heck out of you in resiliency and come back is about the only thing that keeps me hopeful. And if we want to work with nature, she's willing to play and do the right thing. And these fish, as far as I can tell, are a totemic critter that kind of holds your feet to the table of honesty. And there's a wonderful book by this gentleman, Freeman House, called Totem Salmon. It's about a toll watershed in Humboldt County, in California. This idea that the first thing they learn uh, was the importance from salmon was the importance of the watershed as a unit of perception and that helps out with my thinking like a watershed realm and so it really gets me to the fact that the most important place to start in the watershed generally you know is the headwaters and I'm supporting you all recognizing that the most important headwaters to start in is the water in your own dang head right you got to get this up here and so the game with this is how do you mitigate cerebral imperviousness first <laughs> to infiltrate the information and make the change and get rid of the hard-headed, old-school, hydro-illiterate land use mismanagement practices. And so this conference, as far as I can tell, is a great opportunity for cerebral imperviousness mitigation. And that leads me to the work of the day that I'm up to basically is ecosystem restoration. <laughs> a new storyline within the ecosystem. What does the ecosystem believe? And then we can get to ecological restoration, but if the hominids don't get on board with it in a good way, the fish and the water and the trees and the rocks, they're not the problem. It's, it's us, right? We have met the enemy and it, and it is ourselves kind of thing, right? So how do we do that? And it's about perception. And so this conference is a lot about perception, rain to resource. And, so do you perceive stormwater as a problem? Because if you do, you'll pay pipe and pollute it. You, you will bow before the holy trapezoidal straight line channel. You think streamlining isn't just something you do for paperwork, but literally lining streams. There's the phrase form follows function, and there's also the corollary form follows dysfunction. And streamlined channels, as far as I can tell, are mm, less than ideal. And I usually get to rail on the Army Corps of Engineers when I'm <coughs> out. 
Or do you see water as a solution and you're going to slow it, spread it, sink it? Do you believe in a way? Has anyone been there? Do I need a visa to go there, even if I'm in Arizona? Where's a way? On a finite planet, especially water, there's no way. Tell me about the size of the trash patch out in the North Pacific Gyre right now. There's no way. They're not going away. <coughs> so the way is, oh, you want to make it go away? Well, you'll flood your neighbors out downstream. This is our, uh, in the watershed that Anna and I met each other in the Laguna de Santa Rosa. This is the, the treatment plant for a bunch of cities. And that was a very, that was a 10 year event. But they hadn't planned in their thing all of the imperviousness over the 20 years preceding <coughs> to the discharge and the increase in the runoff coefficient. And, and increasingly, in many, many parts of the planet, this is what people are witnessing, just declining groundwater tables. As There's no innocent straw out there, as far as I can tell. And if you're going to put a straw in the ground, and I was a little bit concerned that to learn that, like in California, the last state in the US, you all as well don't regulate groundwater. What I'm told. So the, the groundwater being probably the oldest water, depending on how deep it is, the least recharged, the least connected to the annual income allowance from your hydrologic cycle that year, is the most unregulated. It don't make any sense in California, and I'm, I think that's a transborder uh, uh, circular logic thing that it don't make sense up here either. You got groundwater becomes a really critical, both shallow groundwater that connects to creeks through base flow and deeper groundwater. So I guess, do you believe in the drain age? The age of draining everything where you create a dehydrated, desiccated drain age based design, or do you believe in a retain age where you're gonna slow it, spread it, sink it, and figure out how to see your roof as an above ground well and put it into a tank and see that street as an opportunity and see that area as a, as a as an opportunity to harvest. And we begin to move into concave-based landscape systems versus convex. And, and certainly, and I really honor the different discussions today about freezing and, and, and slopes and slope stability and recharge and soils. And, and so all of this is to be taken with a, a grain of sand or clay, depending on which porosity issue you've got, and design accordingly. And not, but conceptually, how do you perceive it? This is the woman I went to China with, and this idea that if water is the foundation of life, it must also be the foundation uh, in the built environment. I think if I ask the question as a designer, what would water want? If I, if I design a system to take care of the quantity and quality of water through my built environment, whatever that's going to be, rural residential, vineyard, grazing, forestry, <coughs> intensive ag, urbanization, what would water want? If I design to take care of water, what I'll build that does carbon, it does pollution, it does transportation, it does those other functions, I think will be really good. Will be darn well better than what we got now. Um, and we gotta just stop using water. And conservation is the best thing we can do. Just stop using it, and if you're gonna use it, use it efficiently, indoor and outdoor. Do y'all talk much, I haven't heard anybody talk about this thing up here, the water energy nexus. And I was asking Anna a little bit, it sounds like you've got such a big portfolio of hydro that maybe your sense is, is that your electricity grid is has a fairly low water footprint per se. I don't know, but for those of us who are further south and have nuclear in there, coal and oil and these other kinds of systems, um, the connectivity between how much water electricity requires, the footprint of water, is a pretty impressive deal. And again, it depends on where you're at. This, this study comes from the National Renewable Energy Lab down in the states there and so if on average in America we're using 100 gallons a day per person for consumptive use bathing showering washing the dog laundry that kind of stuff and folks really want to cut into that number low flow everything which is great but on average with uh, food miles in our neck of the woods of 1500 miles from food to plate you got to load in another 510 gallons of water just for your food budget we call virtual water in your agricultural production. And then depending on your energy matrix, again, it sounds like maybe yours is, is maybe on the lower end here, I don't know, but there could be somewhere up in this range. So just to live your life, to have electricity and food and consumptive water, you could be using 1,000 gallons a day ahead where I come from. And that's bringing that piece of the puzzle in because each one of these, what's the carbon footprint, CO2, greenhouse gas emissions footprint here, what's the greenhouse gas emissions footprint here, and if you would like to get out reducing your, your CO2 emissions to be in compliance with your, your carbon issues that you have, and my understanding is you guys have got some regs on that, 
then if you don't look at energy, if you don't look at food, if you don't look at transportation, then you're not going to get there, right? And certainly the low impact development world is, is what we've been talking about a lot. And so I'm not going to elaborate on that because you guys are all professionals in that. We do have a group down in San Francisco Bay that's called the Bay Friendly Landscaping folks. And I just like their little diagram here. They really talk about that you're land landscaping locally. You got to nurture the soil, right? We're conserving the water, the quantity and taking care of the quality of both air and water to get better wildlife habitat and have less go into the landfill while we're also conserving energy. And this is what professional landscapers just doing outside landscaping, they buy into these principles and they're building that into their landscape designs as an integrated whole. And, and it's the multiple benefit piece. Some of us last night were talking about gray water. In California, we just rewrote our, it's called chapter 16A of the Uniform Plumbing Code. So now in California, anywhere in the state, if you want to take your laundry, put a three-way brass valve on it and have one side go to the municipal system and one side go out to the landscape into an excavated basin filled with wood chips and a, a opportunity for subsurface disposal. No permit needed anywhere in the state right now in California as of about six months ago for gray water. So now we're t purple pipe is great, but if I can use it on my property, reuse it, take the gallon I showered with or the gallon I did laundry with, and then get that another gallon of irrigation out of that, so I got two gallons of use and only one electricity push through versus pumping it back to you so you can treat it to pump it back to me in a purple pipe. Any way you can get rid of that Rube Goldberg machine at any point in time would be helpful, I think. And then there's a lot of push around that in, in many places, and, and this is in Portland, for looking at your roof to store water as above ground wells. Um, I didn't, I realized I didn't convert these over metrically, so you guys probably are better at that I am going either way, but an inch of rain on a thousand square feet is 600 gallons. So I don't know who does those numbers for me out of your head, the square feet, but it's, it's generally for people, they, it's, it's a larger amount of water than the average person thinks is coming off their roof is the take home message on this deal. And like you all, where I live in a Mediterranean climate with a, generally a four month wet season, I don't know what's happening on the shoulders now, um, and a long dry season, that we need just bigger storage tanks. This is a 27,000 gallon ferro cement tank that gets its water off that roof of that building. That building has five kilowatts of photovoltaics and solar hot water. So the roof keeps the water out, makes all its electricity, makes all its hot water, and catches all the drinking water for the entire operation for the family of three in their home. And they did that to get out of the creek for in-stream flows for fisheries because they had a shallow gallery well. So the mantra where I live, and I kind of think it applies to you all to some degree, is that we don't live in a water scarce area down where I'm at. We live in a storage scarce area. Storage becomes the, the hard piece to sort out. <coughs> In-ground storage or liquid assets in a tank storage, lots of forms of storage, but dispersed decentralized storage. Here's a really simple system that some folks say, well, it's really expensive to do this, and I need a roof, and I need a special gutter, and I need a special fascia board, and all this. And this system is my goat feeding shed for our milking dairy goats. And it's got a single pitch, and here's the nod to the, the folks with the ADS uh, booth out there, the advanced range system plastic pipe folks, I, I just take their little flexible drain pipe, solid pipe, slice it, slide it, and store it. And it basically is a really effective gutter. On any corrugated roof, you can just slice it, slide it, store it. Super cheap, really, really effective for the agricultural operations. In our case, I then gravity feed that out of this tank here down to my chicken yard and the goats. But there's no pumps associated with it. There's no nothing. It's all on a passive gravity fed float switch. I haven't fussed with the water for three years at this point. The flexible drain pipe, we haven't had laying around. So in those rural residential areas, it's pretty effective. The state of California is on board with us here. This is a project we did at a school and, and this is a campus. They catch the water off the roof, put it in a tank, and they have 30,000 gallons for their organic vegetable garden there and the state paid for that system. Our federal government, our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the parent of the National Marine Fishery Service, who regulates our endangered species, our salmonids. They're now looking at, this was a poster from a recent conference, so I give application of roof water harvesting techniques for the conservation of endangered salmonids. So we just got a million and a half bucks out of the Obama stimulus package, 
and we're taking an entire community and getting every house out of the creek for five to six months out of the year by storing water off their roof. We've got the fire hall with 40,000 gallons off its roof. We got one dairy with 70,000. And then this is a dairy off that roof. We have 240,000 gallons underground storage filled off the roof and he will be 100% out of the creek with no in-stream withdrawals from the creek during the entire dry season. All of this is on behalf of maintaining base flow water quality quantity for fisheries with federal funding. Because where I live, coho salmon is the, is the critter we're most concerned about. And sediment is, is the big deal for us as well. Besides water quantity, we got quality and dirt in the creek and how to keep that out of there. If you would like, these are the best books that I know of, this friend of mine, Brad Lancaster, volume one and two, Rainwater Harvesting for Dry Lands and Beyond. I think this deeply applies for you all. That second book is 400 pages of examples of different ways that indigenous people and folks all over the world have managed their watersheds in ways to slow spread and sink. You can find them on the web easy enough. And I'm off to give a talk next week in Albuquerque, New Mexico to the Kivira Coalition. And they've just got these basic watershed principles. So these folks are in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Pretty dry, right? That they're protecting and expanding the moisture storing areas of the landscape, stabilizing the active erosion, preventing further degradation, restoring the dispersed flow and increasing infiltration at every opportunity. That cultivation of restorative plant communities to build the soil and then the site-specific solutions using natural forms and processes. Great little basic set of guidelines. What they look like is up to you all to figure out. They've got a whole vision for carbon ranches, looking at the entire ranch, and the, the title of the conference will be the Carbon Ranch Using Food and Stewardship to Build Soil and Fight Climate Change. And this is what enviros and ranchers have gotten together to talk about down in Albuquerque, in New Mexico, and Arizona. And I know you all have a big ranching community around here. The talk I'm going to give is basically this. It's grain fed, not grain fed. How do we get the animals back on the land and out of the feedlots and stop feeding them corn so that they belch all that methane out of there, right, and get them back on grass? It's better for climate to have cows not burping methane, right? So I'm really looking for a catalytic converter here. <laughs> and ultimately in Watershed, you all know that it's a multi-stakeholder process. And as an, as an omnivore here, I'm interested in people holding lots of stakes up and, and barbecuing those. One of the things we've worked a lot with is several counties, Santa Cruz County now and Sonoma County. We have a, these new documents, Slow It, Spread It, Sink It, this homeowner landowner's guide to beneficial stormwater management. Pretty simple guide, beautiful color pictures, lots of case studies. As far as I can tell, this would be a great project for the Okanagan Water Board and others that partner with them. They'll probably give you the whole document for free, the computer thing. You guys can customize it, add your own photos. And, and print it out. It's a great public outreach education uh, document for getting homeowners on board, which I think you really need. Assuming you've got, you've got the technical prowess and appears the policy prowess. Um, this is out of that Sonoma Valley, folks. They've just finished this brand new slide, mapping the entire watershed based on veg and soil and slopes and geology for its recharge potential. Where it's green, best recharge, yellow, a little bit worse. And they're basically, and then, is it public land? Is it private land? Who owns it? What's the land use? And beginning to set up a long-term plan to retrofit that lifeboat there to be as infiltrative as possible. You guys know a lot about these green streets and narrowing and curb cutouts and bioswales, and I'm not going to go there much. China's pretty much into green streets, as far as I can tell there. <laughs> um, the rain garden thing, I was talking to Anna, we were out at the little ecological center here, and found a spot that looks like a perfect rain garden location. And one of the things I think the rain garden movement needs to do is develop regional plant pallets of your natives that can have their feet wet for three months and then can dry out and can be frozen. And because there's the xeriscape, the upland drought tolerant type landscape, that's pretty well articulated if you go to nurseries. But the nurseries, I don't, at least not where I'm at, have a special rain garden, stormwater garden plant palette, and that would be a really good thing for the, the plant geeks, the botany geeks to bring forward. But what's the Okanagan plant palette for stormwater gardens? This is a project that folks worked on in Tucson, and it's just talking about the value of mulch and vegetation. It was designed to catch water in between these spaces, but previous to them putting the plants and mulch in, they had all this puddling just after a two inch rain event. After they mulched and, and planted it and the plants broke up the hard pan and they've been in for um, a couple years, 
They were getting four inches and there's no ponding and all that water's going in the ground within an hour. And so how do you get those tag team benefits? And they, this whole community here has been looking at basically, if we integrate the water harvesting, there in their case, they got 10 times the flood control capacity of this conventional command control convey system. By moving to a decentralized dispersed perspective, it, the, the point source issue, like Anna was telling me that in the 60s and 70s, your lakes weren't so happy here. And then you all apparently got on board with the point sources and the big pipes and the obvious polluters. Pretty easy, that was the low hanging fruit. Same thing happened in the States. The non-point source pollution, the dispersed flows off of different land uses is really where the tough stuff is at and that's where LIDs come about. And I think you won't ever get at non-point source pollution with centralized solutions. You have to go decentralized because the pollution is decentralized at some level, right? Or site specific kind of stuff. Um, Seattle's really pretty good at this. They've got their natural drainage systems. And I, I like this quote in the report that you can't see it up there, but it says, what if, what if instead of grabbing it in pipes, rainwater was slowed and stopped at the source in private yards and parking lots along the city streets and allowed to soak into the earth? And those kinds of statements, just asking that question, I, I think are uh, provocative to say the least, right? And I don't know if you've looked at their street edge alternatives, was one of the first streets they did as a retrofit. Put the curves in the street, added in rain gardens and rain gardens. They got sidewalks and better parking and traffic calming and improved flood control conveyance and improved water quality and benefits to Salmonids. They got the federal stick off their head. And the property values in this neighborhood are appraising. Last time somebody told me this about a year and a half ago, I don't know what happened to the whole mortgage thing. They were appraising at about 10% more than the houses in the neighborhoods that hadn't had just the street change. What would water want? What's that look like? Portland, really innovative stuff. I think you all know, and they've done a similar thing, looked at specific sub-watersheds in the city. And this watershed, because they have combined sewer stormwater, when, when the stormwater and the sewer go together, there's too much, and that manhole pops up, and the brown trout start floating down the <laughs> street in a fancy neighborhood, and the phone rings, and all you politicians know that you're gonna respond, and it was that was the driver on this. and so. They had a 2000, from 19, or from 2000, the, how, what are they gonna do with combined sewers, stormwater, and map that out? And that was a $144 million concept. And after they got the LID religion, they rethought it out and basically tweaked it, adding different parking lot stormwater rooms and sustainable stuff. And it's gonna cost 86 million instead of 144 up front to do this with all of the green amenities. So they're saving basically 58 million bucks with a greener, better, more livable city. So I think the economics have shown themselves to be warranted. And if you don't think that we can't play this game in the drier parts of the world, then go to, to Los Angeles and look at the work of tree people. Go to a website called the Sun Valley Watershed. This was a San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles, an area with an inch of rain. They hadn't drained it yet, so the school was under two foot of water. And the, the Army Corps of Engineers came in with the Flood Control District and said for 60 million bucks, we'll pave it, we'll pipe it, we'll trapezoidally channelize it to the LA River and make it go away. And the community said, nah, we would rather have, we would rather have new soccer fields, improve the ones we got, we want daylighted streams and creeks, we want water in for local water supply and security. And it's gonna, they came up with a plan, did the cost benefit on it, it was 100 million bucks up front to basically give them a bunch of new ball fields, improving every other ball field, having a series of these underground storm chambers, infiltration basins, because they've got a highly infiltrative gravel sand base <coughs> type of system, and reduce their demand on water from the Colorado and the Sierras, and they're gonna save 400 million bucks over 20 years, and the city of LA and county of LA's flood control departments have changed their names to departments of watershed management. So they got really clear, if you manage the watershed, you don't, your flood issue is significantly decreased. And they've done six of these projects now throughout LA. Their estimate is that they retrofitted a full retrofit of LID type thinking throughout the Los Angeles basin. They could meet 50% of their water need within the rainfall that falls in their basin with an eight inch average rainfall in that system. So they're just wasting water at this point. San Francisco, combined uh, sewer stormwater system, and they really have problems with pollution in the Bay. 
So here's a cross section if you were looking north in the San Francisco Peninsula with the ocean to the west and our San Francisco Bay to the east of what it would have looked like back when it had wetlands and creeks and lakes and dunes. Here's the paved pipe polluted paradigm and this is their low impact design. They're not developing, it's about design because they're already developed of taking the existing infrastructure but basically putting a green icing on that cake. And this is the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission driving this agenda forward and they're, they're, all the muscle they got is going into that vision right now for the whole city. And so they've got really great stormwater design guidelines and lots of information on their website. Um, the single largest landowner in the city and county of San Francisco is the Unified School District. And we have a school garden teacher training program. We have 100 schools in the city that do ecological literacy based curriculum. curriculum. So we're looking at edible schoolyard, but what's a potable schoolyard? What's a drinkable schoolyard? And these are a couple of books that came out of, our, of some of our uh, collaborators. This Asphalt Ecosystems and the San Francisco Green Schoolyard Alliance uh, School Garden book. And I can tell you, if you work with the kids and engage in the K-12 part of things before the cerebral imperviousness is really hardened in the adult era, when they're really open and porous in their headwaters as the youth and get them on this thing, the, the benefits to learning about the whole system, they eat better, nutrition is better, obesity is down, diabetes is down, performance in the school is down. So you all are, I understand, are what, 49% into your health thing here and 25 or so percent into schools? was the recent number, the budget. the budget, your budget I just was told. So how do we increase the education by paying for school gardens and potable school yards to get the kids on board with that so they're healthier and take that chunk off the health budget and scoot it over here and have a preventative system that starts in the school yard by asking what would water want in an integrated curriculum. So I'm back to your life, Bo. You're either gonna convince your community to get on board and pull in the same direction, and I'm preaching to the choir, but the choir needs practice, and we all should sing in tune here together, and then you can go out and try your out on your friends and family at Thanksgiving. They're like, what? You got water on the brain, and you're like, yeah, I do. Um, and get into clarity that land use planning is water use planning, there is no separation. Those are one and the same. Where I come from, water flows uphill to money. It seems to be the case up here. And you got to participate in democracy. You're going to have to step up to the mic. And if Totem Salmon's got to have something to say to the Board of Civics, then so be it. But if we don't, where I'm at, it appears we're getting a lot of freedom, which is free dumb, D-U-M-B. Right? We're free to be dumb because we have a disconnected, apathetic um, proletariat. And that's why I'm thankful you all have invited me to come live in the Okanagan, because things are not looking so good down south. So I don't know, you tell me, are you part of the problem? part of the solution to precipitate. Can you precipitate the change that's needed here? Can you make that move and engage in what I call conservation hydrology? Right? How do we adapt our water footprint for the regenerative, rehydrative, receiving, recharging, retaining, releasing, retrofit of human land use that ultimately connects and reconnects, in my case, the creeks are clear, cold, and copious for coho. You could say kokanee. Still got the alliteration, which I'm happy about. What is that going to look like? What is that going to look like? And so I got the slow water manifesto. There's slow food, but if you don't have a slow water manifesto, which basically says you got to slow it, spread it, sink it, but you darn well better think it. And so that's really about rainwater harvesting first before you get to rainwater harvesting. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs> speechless. <laughs> Never happens to me. Um, if any of the rest of you aren't speechless, we have a couple of minutes for uh, questions. Yeah, no. Yeah. If, uh, <clears throat> if the tragedy of this room is, is that you're talking to people who the message is easily to get to, and for most of them they have to somehow push that message up the pipeline. If we could arrange a return visit where we guarantee you a tour of the valley to sample all the wines of the valley, <laughs> and if we could collect all those politicians together in one place so that it didn't become so much bottom uh, uh, pushing up, would you come back? Sure. <laughs> Quite honestly, right, where I come from, we say stop it some more. <laughs> how, how many? There's one mayor here. One single 
This summer, uh, going into the summer, we were worried. The, the big lake was was down, down, down. Oh my God, oh my God, we're going to be short of water. And then it rained like hell in June. And everybody said, oh, we don't have a problem at all. And, and all those messages of water conservation kind of just sort of slid off the edge of the table. I mean, I think you've just got to work every angle you can. And there's the, the political legislative angle on this piece. And then there's just the people in the street. And how which lever you pull. and. Um, you know, there's that great Archimedes quote about give me a place to stand and a lever big enough and I could move the world. So what I'm interested in is pick, take your stand. And I think you're taking a stand for the Okanagan. Figure out where your leverage is in that system. The, the lever you're designing is basically this vision of a, of a rain to resource retrofit and then convince everybody you can. And that's people, that's school kids, that's local business, that's the wine industry, and that's the politicians. Everybody who lives in your lifeboat. So, each of you all have different uh, demographic sectors that you have influence and leverage with, and you're all going to have to go out and leverage the the whole piece of the puzzle. And sometimes the people will, the cry will come from the grassroots, and sometimes the policy goes down. And you have these nested jurisdictions that are both vertically nested and horizontally interactive and engaged. And I, social change happens through that multiplicity of the connectivity between uh, people interfacing with each other. Um, if you want to get the message across to your mayors and counselors, I urge you to go to the Environmental <coughs> Law Clinic website, the University of Victoria Environmental Law Clinic website. The video that was shown this, uh, this morning is on that website. It's a 10 minute video and, uh, and councils eat it up. We've been showing it to the Capital Regional District. They loved it. We were showing it to Victoria Spinal. But it's on the website. Show it to it. It takes 10 minutes. My observation is you've got amazing spokespeople in this community and just the folks I've interacted with here on the Okanagan Water Board. You guys got all the brain power you need to, to pitch this message and work it through. I mean, I'm happy to come back for the wine, but in my carbon footprint to get me up here is, right? Yep. Uh, one quick, uh, thank you very much, by the way. That is a great job. And I'm a politician, so uh, I want to make hands. sure the rest of the, our council gets it. But I'm particularly interested in your uh, asphalt to ecosystem with uh, using the school properties because we do have school properties that where local government still fighting the school boards about using community taxpayer land in some other use than the school if it's not being used as a school. How, how do you get to doing an ecosystem on, on that school property? I mean we are mainly we've gotten in with the schools via Nutrition and education, nutritional education, obesity, uh, diabetes issues, and the and the ecological literacy around school gardens. What are what are it's called place-based education, where you teach the multiple intelligences. And we wrote a series of curricula that we passed through the California state standards, so you could teach garden education and be in compliance with what's called our science framework so that they can still pass their little star tests, their little <laughs> tests that the kids have to pass each grade. So we, we went at it through a curricular link by building relationships with the principal, with teachers, with the parents, with the janitorial staff, and it's been school by school until there's been enough critical mass. In the case of San Francisco, they created the Green Schoolyard Alliance, and when they had bond money to retrofit schools, these folks stepped up and said, we'd like a retrofit, but instead of paving it more so we can have more basketball, courts or volleyball courts, tetherball, we would ra rather have increased green space. And, and we see that you guys in San Francisco, this that case there, that you're up against it for impervious surfaces because you've got this combined sewer storm water and you need to reduce that. And your largest landowner in the city county is the school district. So let's invest the money in the public property on behalf of the city and the bay, the students themselves improve that in overall interaction. And so there's just been a, it's a, it's been a 15 year long collaborative that's got policy folks, on the ground folks, educators, books and things and asphalt ecosystems is just the obvious uh, buzzword at this moment. 
And we're so beyond even arguing about whose ass is at fault for the stuff, right? We just go to the, right? You gotta go to the greenscape and just leave the hard stuff behind. All right, well, thank you All so right. much, Brock. I thank you, madam. <laughs> well, see, I can And I know, uh, Now, Michael McClatchy, and he is going to be facilitating the panel. So, Brock will be back on the panel, and a uh, number of other notable figures. And so, uh, I, I know it's uh, th this talk that we just heard, I'm hoping will have stimulated questions in your mind, as well as all the things that we went through today and yesterday. And uh, we can talk about how we can really um, implement some of these ideas at the panel. Oh, Mike, Mike is doing a presentation first, sorry. Then we're doing a panel, okay. So, um, I'm happy to introduce Mike, Mike McClatchy. I uh, what, had the pleasure of working with him on another conference, on the CWRA conference uh, in June of last year, and this is where we met. And um, I'm really glad to have him come back again today. So, he's a uh, another great knowledgeable water resource we have here. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm sorry. Actually, I'd be just as fine jumping right to the panel discussion if that's okay. But <laughs> I was uh, listening to Brock's incredible uh, talk there from the back of the room, realizing that my presentation was coming up, and I started to get this little sinking feeling when I realized that <laughs> following up Brock's very dynamic uh, talk, I was going to be talking about a position paper. Uh, which is probably about as dry as you can get in terms of content. In any case, I hope you won't hold that against me. Um, as the chair of the uh, Stormwater Management Committee at BCWWA, for which I was voluntold by Chris Johnson uh, that I should take that position, we were tasked uh, a few months ago with developing a position paper for BCWWA to address issues of stormwater management. And uh, I'll just give you some overview on that. First, I'll talk about BCWWA's process for developing position papers, uh, some motivations for this particular position paper, uh, some of the background science that goes into how, where we came up with our position, and then the direction uh, that we've taken with it. And finally, there is an opportunity still for input into this process from uh, BCWWA members and others who have an interest. And uh, that's where we'll end up, and then we'll go to the panel discussion. Uh, BCWWA has an established process for developing these position papers. First of all, some, at some level, generally at the board level or, or an interested party brings forward an issue and they identify the topic and they develop a context statement that's supposed to be addressed by an issue analysis paper. Uh, the issue analysis paper lays the groundwork for developing the position statement. Uh, there are several requirements for the uh, issue analysis paper. It has to be well researched and uh, provide a regulatory context. Uh, content developed from fortune cookie contents is not valid. Uh, it has to be factual and scientific based, so reference papers, research, uh, knowledge within the industry. It has to be balanced. It has to prevent, uh, present all sides of the issue that's being considered, so pros and cons, limitations, constraints, and things like that. And then from there, we, uh, from the issue analysis paper, once it's been discussed and accepted by the leadership committee and the board of BCWWA, that leads to the development of a draft position statement based on that issue analysis paper. From there, after a period of communication and consultation, which is hopefully not too long, uh, you arrive at a final position statement as approved by the board of BCWWA, and then that becomes uh, out in the domain for uh, to provide guidance and uh, advice to BCWWA's members, be they municipalities or other practitioners and things like that. So in this case, the problem statement, innocent as it seems in that one sentence, should appropriate levels of treatment be required for stormwater? I started into the initial analysis, issue analysis paper with uh, committee members and became apparent quite quickly that even though that would appear to be a focus statement, it was still a very, very broad topic with many facets. So after some discussion and based on the information that's available, 
it was decided to focus in on issues of stormwater quality or water quality arising from runoff from settlement development areas, by which I mean partially uh, suburban or urbanized areas. And I'm just cautious using the term urban because I don't want somebody from a town to think that, well, they're not a major city, so they're not urban. If you have a standard residential development in a small town, it may only affect one small watershed. But within that small watershed, you'll see the same kind of issues as you would see in a large urbanized area like Metro Vancouver, but spread out over a great many watersheds. So I just, you know, don't assume that when I say urban, I'm, I'm just talking about the large Metro Vancouver's of the world. Why are we even looking at this? Well, I think it's already known by everyone in this room, and I'm probably stating the incredibly obvious, but stormwater is known to be impacting receiving waters, be they freshwater or marine or anything like that. So. By doing so, it's limiting the use of those waters for what is known as beneficial uses and the legalities of, of the area. So those beneficial uses can include recreation, body contact recreation like swimming, water skiing. Uh, the use of that water for drinking water, it may not absolutely prevent it, but because the water quality is compromised, it may require higher levels of treatment than would otherwise be the case. The water might not be suitable for agriculture, for example, because if it has very high fecal coliforms and things, other pollutants from wash off from the land, it would not, might not be safe to apply to uh, food crops. Industrial uses might be impaired because the water quality is not suitable for, uh, for the particular use that the industry wants to make of it. And of course, last but not least, very important ecological functions, supporting fisheries, uh, aquatic habitats, uh, various aquatic organisms that fish depend on, all those things, that can be very much compromised by a decline in water quality. Some specific examples, uh, for example, in Environment Canada has identified through uh, sediment sampling on the, the bottoms of harbors, for example, in Greater Vancouver, Victoria, that they are essentially contaminated sites. At least some of the contaminants they've detected can be attributed to stormwater, as, as well as industrial discharges, bilge discharges from ships and things like that. But those contaminants include metals, hydrocarbons, uh, other compounds like pesticides, um, things like that. Obviously not great to have around. The sediment itself that can, uh, stormwater can wash off the, um, the landscape, off, uh, off the developed lands can become a contaminant either uh, from clogging spawning gravels or damaging fish tissue uh, or because many contaminants bind themselves to fine sediments. So uh, some uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, things like that can become bound to fine sediments, uh, which generally makes the problem much worse. From this, it becomes clear we need to find uh, a strategy for enhancing or protecting the receiving waters to ensure that the quality is uh, retained or uh, improved. It's very hard, oops. It's hard to find visual examples of water quality contamination since many contaminants are, are not readily visible, dissolved substances and things like that. But here we have some, uh, some runoff into a, an agricultural ditch. It's actually coming from an upland area which is developed. And you can see that the water is quite foamy and white, and that's because some, some wonderful substances in there like surfactants, probably some hydrocarbons and things like that. And so it very visually demonstrates the impact of the water quality. I'm sure there's probably other things in there that are not visible, high nutrient loads, um, any number of other things. At the macro pollution scale, uh, we have a couple oil jug containers, antifreeze containers, things like that, various floating debris. Now that's not really what I'm, uh, addressing in this paper because obviously that can be handled in a different way but it does have some good shock value and that's about the limit of the colorful pictures and slides in my presentation conventionally stormwater management many years back and even persisting to to this present day in some cases has uh, involved a pipe and convey approach which several others have mentioned over the course of this uh, workshop Basically, you gather up the rainwater as quickly as possible, force it into a pipe, and uh, carry it downstream so that it becomes other, somebody else's problem. In the course of doing that, you increase flow rates and increase the transport and mobilization of pollutants, both from the, uh, the creek corridor and washing off the land surface. And you certainly uh, are facilitating that process that degrades water quality. 
more recent conventional strategies have at least tried to address, tried to address the peak flow issue, looking at uh, using various methods to slow down the water, uh, detain it for a period of time, and then release it more slowly as a way of trying to reduce flooding impacts. Generally, these strategies, the strategies have little or no benefit in addressing the water quality issues that arise. Here is a classic uh, dry detention pond, which it looks really pity, uh, pretty with uh, grass and things around it, but when it floods, all it really does is hold the water back for a period of time. There's very little that that pond does to address water quality issues. It probably helps uh, reduce flooding downstream and may help the stream corridor a bit by reducing peak flow rates that cause erosion, but that's about the limit of its functionality. On the water quality mitigation side, um, there are two sort of distinct strategies or categories of approaches that can be applied uh, to address the water quality. One is source controls, which sort of have two subcategories. One is that you have source controls on site that treat the contamination, take it out of the water, or even better, you prevent, prevent the contamination from occurring at the source in the first place. Then there's uh, end of pipe treatment processes, which are applied with some degrees of success. You can have a passive treatment system like an engineered wetland or some kind of active treatment process which uh, involves uh, oil water separators, constructed infrastructure like that. Uh, so as I, uh, as I say, there's wetlands, there's proprietary treatment units. Probably the most extreme example I can think of as an end of pipe solution for stormwater management <coughs> is also in place to address CSOs is Chicago's Tunnel and Reservoir Project, which is a massive project to drill 40-foot diameter tunnels under the city of Chicago with large drop wells and uh, pumping systems that collect the runoff from a storm, and then over time pump it out through treatment plants so that it can be treated pretty much like uh, any raw sewage would be treated going through a treatment plant. As I say, that's a fairly extreme example, and probably re represents the fact that Chicago can't go very far in retrofitting to a more green infrastructure or a green landscape in any reasonable time scale. It probably also represents the fact that the EPA was threatening to sue them for tens of millions of dollars for contaminating Lake Erie. <coughs> so it seems source control approaches uh, are probably a more reasonable answer in many cases. So a shift to source control approaches is definitely always already underway in stormwater management. We've seen that talked about uh, several times in this workshop. Uh, the original motivation, uh, one of the motivations for uh, source controls is to ensure the sustainability of water courses, that they remain healthy and they preserve their function as uh, aquatic habitat for fisheries purposes, and also just uh, an aesthetic and uh, nurturing role for the community. These needs are compounded by the magnification that uh, climate change will impact on uh, stormwater runoff and the problems that you see in the water courses. So generally, it involves implementing strategies to control runoff volumes on the site. This can be changes in zoning, landform designs, landscape designs, uh, various kinds of constructed systems like infiltration chambers, any number of things that can achieve that end. While most of them are steered towards controlling runoff volumes, they also have a parallel benefit in that many are fairly effective at protecting water quality. Uh, just as an example here, a semi-pretty photo of a previous paving uh, application in the Lower Mainland. Uh, from far up, you can see that the texture of the pavement is quite a bit different from uh, normal pavement. And in the close-up, you can see that it's very, uh, very open-looking paving. And what they do is they leave the fines out of the paving structure so that it's open-graded. And it allows water to seep through the pavement into the subgrade. Uh, which controls runoff, but also can have an amending effect on the water in terms of treating contaminants and removing them from the water before it makes its way through the groundwater to a creek. Uh, another aspect of source control approaches is recognizing the very direct link between your land use activities and what happens to the water that's running off the site and entering the, wa uh, the water courses. One thing you can do, as I mentioned earlier, is modify land uses or the development form, the landscaping, way structures are built to minimize the runoff and mimic natural hydrology, uh, minimizing impervious cover, maintain as much of the natural vegetation and natural areas, and capture rainfall for use on site or for later release. This kind of approach can avoid uh, or reduces costly infrastructure investment and maintenance. Again, 
you'll often see that on the runoff side, but it can also provide a benefit on the water quality side. Certainly, if you don't have to go through uh, uh, actually actively treating your water or anything like that. The end of pipe approaches are not very popular in stormwater management for good reason. Uh, stormwater is often too dilute or poorly characterized for you to establish a, a specific treatment train to uh, address water quality issues. Also, the, of course, the flow rates are highly variable, so it's hard to design treatment systems that can handle very uh, variable flow, flow rates. However, there are very uh, specific situations where you might want to look at end of pipe treatment. For example, uh, sometimes source controls are difficult to apply in steeply sloped terrain on site and uh, or in densely developed areas where you might not have the land uh, available for the footprint. So there will always be a specialized role for these units. I think, for example, of downtown Vancouver, which is very highly impervious, very high value land and completely crowded with buildings, where many of the uh, low impact development approaches are going to be hard to retrofit and are, aren't likely to come into uh, vogue down there to any great extent, at least not in the near future. This is a, a, a type of end of pipe treatment unit. It doesn't fortunately look much like a treatment unit. It's simply a constructed engineered wetland at the end of a storm drainage system. Uh, it looks reasonably nice, the ducts like it, and it does definitely provide a benefit in uh, protecting water quality. So obviously there, there will still be, a, still be applications such as this uh, built in the future. For BCWWA, looking at our very narrow water quality issue in stormwater, we decided that uh, we would recommend a hierarchy of mitigation strategies, and I caution that this hasn't been formally accepted. It's still in dis discussion, but it's the direction we're going. The first is to the extent possible, apply source controls of all types to avoid or prevent impact at the site level. So try and keep it as close to the site as possible and prevent it if at all possible. This can be applied to new development and redevelopment as, occur as it occurs, and to some extent also as retrofit, although that's not going to be the major mechanism by which it comes into play. And height approaches, uh, such as wetlands, things like that, are still going to need to be applied in special circumstances, as I alluded to, very high density areas that already exist, or uh, where land use changes are not going to occur for, for a great period of time where retrofits are difficult, or where the specific site conditions, such as soils or steep slopes, make it unlikely that source controls will be successful. Moving forward from this, as I said, these are sort of draft positions at this point. There's definitely an opportunity for input to the current analysis position paper process through BCWWA. There will also be other future position papers developed to address the aspects of stormwater and rainwater management that we haven't picked up in this first attempt at a position paper. So that would be volume reduction, i.e. runoff control, uh, reuse of rainwater on site to reduce total runoff, and other aspects of stormwater, such as agricultural and industrial runoff, uh, which has different characteristics and also, in some cases, different legal frameworks that have to be dealt with. Uh, I'm just going to include a quick plug here for BCWWA Stormwater Management Committee. Uh, we're looking for committee members, uh, definitely looking for participants who can help with this process and uh, move things forward. So if you're interested, uh, we have an expression of interest form for BCWWA that you can fill out and forward through DAISY. Or if you want to contact me directly, that'd be a good way to go. So if there are any questions. Jim. Um, we definitely could. That's more of a specific criteria where this isn't a, a position statement that we're looking at to advise people that they need to address these issues. They've been living with those criteria for a long time. Yeah. Many years now, and uh, got the system down the science down, and all the developments are fine. Mm-hmm. But not really fine. Yes, I realize that. Um, well, the position paper is being developed to support moving towards getting those things, uh, kind of things implemented. Whether there'll be hard regulations or not is not within BCWWA's sort of venue to establish. Yeah. 